So why can't the numbers on the build plate actually be the build volume for that printer? Why do these manufacturers gotta play games? So I feel like the build volume of a printer should be pretty straightforward, but we still have machines coming out claiming one size, but being unable to actually back it up. I guess I just think no one would ever check. Between exclusion zones for filament cutters and simply not letting the full build volume be used, someone's lying or misdirecting us, either intentionally or by accident. I wonder which it is. Like, have you seen the specs for the H2D build volume? Well, what's going on? But marketing talk aside, let's take a look at what the actual build volume is on some of these popular newer printers and see if the numbers actually match up. All right, so this idea came to me initially when I was doing the review of the FL Sun T1. I drew up a shape that closely represented that build volume, tried to max out the entire build envelope, and print it out solid. And you know, it came up with a reasonable enough result, but that got me thinking about my other machines. From there, I printed out a solid cube, maxing out the build volume on my P1S. It was the P1S or it was the X1 Carbon, I don't actually remember, but the build volume's the same. That's when I first had to contend with this exclusion zone here. But the method to exclude that from the model was actually pretty simple, and I didn't even need to do any CAD work. I simply opened Orca Slicer, imported a cube, maxed out the build volume, and then imported a negative cube in the exclusion zone. I scaled everything accordingly and merged them together, and that's what got me this box here. Now, I wanted the box to be strong enough that it could be handled, but I didn't want it to be like super filament thirsty. So I gave it three walls, but I used support cubic and a really low infill density. This would support the top layers as needed, but still leave the lower layers that didn't need any supports kind of unsupported without much infill. I pushed print after loading up this orange COPE from Polymaker, and the final result looks pretty cool. I like having this physical representation to compare against other machines. It's really interesting to hold a physical object that represents the build volume that we're working with. Now the big issue I had with this system immediately was the storage. What do I do with this box? All I have in this room are a bunch of boxes that print things. I don't need more boxes that don't print things especially. It was time to rethink my approach. I jumped into Onshape and thought my way through what's a more thoughtful way to waste a bunch of filament with a useless model. Well, this time I wanted to focus on an easier thing to store and conveying a little bit more information. Those were the two requisites. My plan was simple. I would still print a box, but it would only be three sides of that box. This wasn't necessarily in the name of saving material because more or less the surface area is kind of the same. Sure, there's less infill, so it's not gonna be quite as thirsty, but by and large, this is still a very thirsty model. No, no, the primary focus of this shape was to make something that would stack easily and store away and still allow for easy comparison from machine to machine. So I labeled each face with the axis that it could represent and arrows pointing in the direction of those axes. Threw on some chamfers and stuff to finish everything up a little bit. And from there I could easily import the model into the slicer, scale it using the claimed values for that printer, and even throw some text on the side so I knew which printer each build volume belonged to. Now since this shape is still a cube with harsh corners, it's gonna warp like crazy. There's no way around that. Especially the side that had the walls on it, that was gonna be subject to like all of the forces as the print gets taller and more layers are stacked on top. Also the upper layers were gonna be subject to a lot of wobbling. Even if it's not on a bed slinger, there's just gonna be wobbling artifacts no matter what because it's a tall skinny model. But it was gonna work well enough for me, so I sent it. Now with that settled, which printer should I start with? Somebody commented on my Cobra 3 Max video telling me they wanted to see me max out the build height. This printer claims a 420 by 420 by 500 millimeter volume, so today we're gonna check it. I imported my build volume model and I scaled it according to the claimed values that this printer said it could print. I found that the slicer allowed for a 500 millimeter build height, no problem. But when I scaled X and Y, 419 was the most that I could squeeze out of it. Couldn't get that full 420. 
I suppose that's close enough. Not like it's trying to hide some exclusion zone for a filament cutter in the corner or something like that. That would sure be silly. With the printer set up, I sliced it and found that it would take more than two spools of filament just to print this useless model. So for the bulk of the model, I chose this Overture yellow filament. But for the beginning of the model, I decided to finish off this gradient spool of Chidu filament that I had almost done from a couple of prints before. So I told the machine that each filament slot was the same color and the same material. That way, when one would run out, it would just move on to the next one all the way down the line. This would allow the print to continue going if I wasn't there to babysit it and refeed spools. So two days and some change later, this is what we've got. Like I suspected, the bottom layer warped like crazy and the top layers were subject to a lot of ripples and stuff. You can really see it in this print. But you know what? It completed without failing and in all things considered, it doesn't actually look that bad. Now let's talk for a second about PCBWay because they're sponsoring this episode. PCBWay is your one-stop shop for anything manufacturing, but at a consumer level. So you don't need to have big machines or fancy electronics to get stuff done. If you're a tinkerer like me, this is an excellent thing to have in your back pocket. Whether we're talking about 3D printing, CNC milling, PCB manufacturing, PCBWay can help you out. They've got factories so you don't have to. The idea of finishing some projects can be daunting, particularly if they're outside of the realms of 3D printing, but having that available makes it a little bit less daunting. So why don't you check the link in the description if you're looking to do something that PCBWay can help you out with. Thanks to PCBWay for sponsoring this video and now let's get back to seeing how the manufacturers rob us of our precious build volume. So now that we've got the big one done, let's look at the little brother, the Anycubic Cobra S1. While I still had that terrible Anycubic slicer open, I decided to throw this model in for the little printer. This time I scaled it according to the 220 by 220 by 250 that this printer calls for. And you know what happened? It just worked. There weren't any issues with the model going outside the boundaries of the build plate. There weren't any exclusion zones to contend with. It just printed exactly how the dimensions advertised said it would print. What a crazy thought. I printed this one using this beautiful green silk PLA from New Makers. Now this print turned out fantastic, and I imagine that was helped by the fact that it wasn't a bed slinger, so though there were ripples in the upper layers, they weren't nearly as bad as we saw with the Cobra Max. That said, there's definitely some wobbles happening. Otherwise, nothing else to report. It was pretty straightforward. The filament performed superbly though, and the machine handled the tall skinny model pretty well. This is quite the good looking box thing, I guess. Now on to one that wasn't quite as straightforward. Scaling the build volume model for the Chidi Plus 4 was super annoying to say the least. I think I finally managed to get it to fit at like 299 or 300 millimeters for X and Y, which I guess is close enough to the advertised 305 by 305. The claim 280 build height was accurate at least, but the X and Y were a little bit gray. For starters, we had to contend with default profile settings like the skirt. That's easy enough to deal with, but the exclusion zone was actually a problem. This one was super deceiving. Though there's a little white box depicting it on the build plate and the slicer, this one's exclusion zone was like way bigger than that. But once I finally figured out a reasonably sized negative cube to join to the build volume model to take that chunk out, we were ready to print. Since I damaged my standard plate during the composite showdown that we did with this machine, Chidi was gracious enough to send me a new smooth plate. This one's meant for high temperature materials. It's super cool. It was out of stock when I was reviewing the machine and when I was doing the composite showdown. But they sent one to me after that, so thank you, Chidi. Where did I put that camera? Oh. Hmm. 
if you haven't been paying attention, we've got this huge giveaway going on. You could win yourself some printers, some filament, all sorts of good stuff. This is some of the filament right here. This is also some of the filament. And that's one of the printers. I'll put a link with some instructions, but we got a lot going on and there's a lot of stuff to win. It could all be yours. Well, one of the things could be yours. All you gotta do is watch our We Pick Random Filament video, fill out the entry form, you could win. So what have you got to lose? Now I decided to use this COPE from Polymaker on this one. This stuff prints like PLA using PLA settings. The only other major difference between this stuff and PLA is the fact that it grips to standard PEI build sheets like crazy. So much so that Polymaker recommends you use a smooth build plate whenever you're printing with this material. Now I wanted to use the standard already damaged build plate that I had. I wanted to see if the COPE would adhere enough to rip off the stuck on ASA that was left over from the composite showdown. So I pressed print and I crossed my fingers. And to my surprise, it didn't do anything. The COPE printed super well and the model turned out great, but the build plate was still stuck with the constant reminder of my past failures, staring at me every time I decided to use it. Oh well, let's move on to some bamboo machines. First in the bamboo lineup is the A1 Mini. You may have seen this happening during the recent video we did where we upgraded this A1 Mini with a bunch of Panda stuff. This was one of the first pieces that I printed after performing these upgrades to this machine. Again, I used Polymaker COPE and I used this sick orange color and it turned out super great, despite this one being a bed slinger like the Cobra Max. The build volume was small enough that it wasn't overly affected by the motion system and as a result the drawbacks weren't very present in the final model. Setting this one up in the slicer wasn't very difficult, luckily we didn't have to contend with things like exclusion zones. The only catch that we came across with this one is the actual size versus the advertised size. This machine boasts an incredibly cute 180 cubed build volume. But if you try and print that full 180 bud, you're out of luck. Now if you want to print 179 cubed, this is the machine for you. So once again, we're being robbed of one precious millimeter, being fed lies right to our faces. Let's continue our investigation because I have a feeling that this is not going to be the last deception that we encounter. Moving on to the more standard size machines in the bamboo lineup. I printed this one on the X1C using this Overture Gray PLA. But again, this is interchangeable with the build volume on the P1P, the P1S, and the A1. Now the claimed build volume for these printers is 256 cubed. First of all, that's a super random number. Second of all, that's not even the usable print volume. When I loaded this model in, I was only able to get 250 cubed. Anything else went outside of the boundaries of the plate and it would not slice. But of course, there was yet another hurdle to overcome. You guessed it, the exclusion zone. For this printer, this is the area that needs to be free of any model to prevent the tool head from colliding with anything while it's performing a filament cut for color changes and things like that. So once again, I imported a negative cube and guessed and checked on the scale and stuff a bunch of times by joining it with the model. After a handful of attempts, I successfully joined the models in a suitable way and printed out this one. And again, the print went super well. I would argue that this is the best looking one that we've had out of any of these build volumes so far, just in terms of quality. But when you stack this against all the other build volumes we're beginning to amass so far, we're really beginning to see how they all compare, even though these build volumes are advertised to be kind of the same. Finally, the last machine I wanted to play around with was the H2D. This printer's got some goofy dimensions and really this is what kickstarted this idea for me again. I wanted to print out a build volume model, but I also wanted to color code it to indicate which nozzles could print where and that sort of thing. This would make it easier to visualize what you can actually print inside of that goofy build volume. So I jumped into Bamboo Studio and went to work. Now there were a couple of items that we were gonna need to address. First of all, the sides needed to be different colors for the areas that only the left or right nozzle could reach. To do this easily, I flipped the model on its side and used the height range coloring tool to color each side of the model. It may not be the right way, but it was the easy way. Once I got that nailed down, I needed to find a place for the prime tower. I always print with a prime tower because it adds a level of reliability and quality to my prints. You may not print with a prime tower because you think it's a waste. That's what makes the world great. We're all different. Now, since the model took up the entire build volume, the only place that I could put the prime tower was kind of right in the middle of the model. 
So I took a chunk out of the middle of the model and that's where we put the prime tower. This looked fine to me, so I sent the print to the machine and I waited the couple of days that it took for it to print off. Now during the early layers of this print, it was pretty obvious that this one was gonna warp super bad, like as bad or worse than the Cobra Max did. The larger print beds seemed to struggle with this geometry especially bad, but luckily this one didn't fail. Not only did it not fail, it actually looks pretty good considering the amount of warping that it started with. And it's a great visual representation of this goofy build volume. The areas in orange are for the left nozzle only. The red is the center of the Venn diagram. And the areas in yellow is the right nozzle only. Regrettably, I forgot to put the name on this one. So that kind of sucks and I'm not reprinting it. But luckily by looking at it, you can tell which machine it is. I'm not reprinting that. So there you have it. What did we learn today? Nothing new, I guess. I think we always knew that the build volume and the usable build space were kind of two different numbers anyway. But this confirmed it for sure. More importantly, these models serve as a fun way to visualize the build volumes in real space. And you can put them next to each other and compare one another. It's kind of a fun thing. Numbers are often difficult to wrap your head around, so it's nice to have a physical object. I'll have this model listed in the description if you too want to waste a bunch of filament printing out one of these not cube things. But let me know what machines you'd like to see featured with this treatment. What other build volumes do you want to see printed in real space? There's a handful around here, for example, that I didn't do, like the Centauri Carbon. Also, Paul's Creality K2 would have been a good contender for this if the thing wasn't broken all the time. So I guess that one's out of the question. I don't know, let me know what you think in the comments. Bye!